One of the trickiest situations you might find yourself in when mixing is if you ever have to mix vocals over a two track or a pre-mixed beat. This is like what you see on screen right now. This is an instrumental with all the elements rendered down into a single file. That means I have no access to the stems or the track outs. Now, the problem with a two track beat like this is you don't have control over the individual elements. You have to make this entire stereo file work and anything that you do to this file will ultimately affect everything in that mix. In the process of that, you could run into a bunch of different issues, such as not being able to get the vocal to sit perfectly over top or within the beat, which could be a product of a number of things like frequency clashing, volume management, and so on. Stuff that we're gonna explore in this video. Now it goes without saying, it's always better to have access to the track outs, but sometimes this isn't the reality. And if you're watching this video, chances are you've run into these situations or are maybe even dealing with it yourself right now. And I know that in the modern music industry, this is a common situation that you will come across from time to time. Because of that, I'm gonna show you how I approach mixing vocals over a two track beat and also provide you with a framework that you can follow to do the same thing. But one thing I can't do in this video is miraculously improve a poorly mixed beat and neither can you. It's gonna be very difficult to do that. So the first prerequisite before we get started here is to make sure you have access to a high quality two track that is mixed well and ultimately sounds good already before you've done anything else. If it isn't, while some of what I'm about to show you will still be helpful, the stuff is not necessarily going to miraculously improve the quality of your instrumental. We need to start with a high quality instrumental first and then work from there. So with that said, let's first start by discussing the setup. In terms of how I have my session structured, I have all of my individual vocal files and I have my two track beat down here. Now, all of these files ultimately feed up to two subgroups, one being the acapella master, which is where all the vocal tracks go, and the other being the instrumental master, which is where the single two track also outputs to. Both of these tracks ultimately go out to my mastering. Now, the reason why I have everything organized like this, particularly for the instrumental, is I wanna have a lot of control over over it. In this case, my audio track outputting to a group gives me access to a bunch of plugin slots should I need to do a variety of processing. Furthermore, I can adjust the level of my actual instrumental before I go into the instrumental group, and I can also do that at the clip gain level. Really what I'm saying here is I just want to have a lot of control, and I may not necessarily use all of that control, but I'd rather have that, especially since at the end of the day, both the instrumental and the acapella are going to combine at this level before going up to the mastering. I want to make Make sure that I have the maximum amount of control over both and the ability to put some processing on there, compressors, EQs, and so on to get a nice blend. With that being said, we can now talk about the next step, which is setting levels. Now, it should come as no surprise that the first set of levels you should set is the instrumental itself. It's the biggest, the most dynamic sound in the mix, especially since it's all of those instrumental elements. So you want to set that first, and we specifically want to set it up and build some headroom in there so that we have room for the vocal and room for the track as a whole to be turned up later through the mastering process. So with that being said, I'm actually gonna mute the acapella and make sure that we're not hearing any vocals. And the first thing we're gonna do is set our actual instrumental level. Now, before I do anything, I wanna leave everything at zero. So my group is at zero and so is my instrumental channel. What I wanna do is I wanna just play the track and see what level am I hitting already? Am I clipping? Is there anything that needs to be done as a pre-treatment before we even hit the group? And to do that, I'm gonna play the loudest section of the instrumental as well, because obviously that'll be the most dynamic or the loudest moment that would indicate if we're clipping or encountering any problems. So as you can see, we're hitting zero. I'm not hearing any distortion, but we are essentially passing digital zero. So just as a buffer, what I'm gonna do is go to the actual clip gain itself and just turn it down by minus 0.1. I could also do this on my fader level since this is the part before we go into the instrumental, but I wanna do it at the clip gain level first because that's essentially the first stage of the gain staging process. I can affect it there first before we go into the plugins, before we go into the fader, and therefore before we go into the group. So with this being said, now we should still be achieving the maximum possible level for this section of the instrumental, but we should now have at least that 0.1 dB of headroom. Let's see.
and you can see that we're no longer hitting digital zero. And again, even though we weren't hearing any clipping, I just want to do that as a safety precaution. Now, with that being done, what I'm going to do is actually take my instrumental and bring the volume all the way down to infinite. And then I'm going to turn it up. But as I turn it up, I'm going to watch this instrumental track itself. I'll switch the view mode to peak so we could see how much headroom we have exactly. And my goal here is to ultimately increase it to a place where I'm still achieving a loud mix, but I have more headroom. Really, loudness is not the concern. It's having headroom available so that we can hear the vocal. So I'm going to bring this up. And my goal here to start will be to have somewhere between minus 10 to minus 6 dB of headroom. And I'm just going to use my taste to decide that there really isn't one concrete rule. Just use your ears and your judgment, but make sure you have at least minus 6 dB of headroom to start. Here we go. So unsurprisingly, we brought our instrumental track down to minus six. And when you combine that with the minus 0.1 reduction before, you're going to see that in our instrumental group here, we're achieving a minus 6.1 amount of headroom. We have that much distance from digital zero from clipping. And now we have the room to bring in the vocals without having them have to be pushed really aggressively, right? A lot of people, the mistake that they make is they leave the instrumental at zero and then they try to bring their vocals in around it. Well, the beat is typically already mastered. It's already very loud. And now you're trying to bring in some other elements and you're going to make them even louder. And now you have these two loud elements, the vocal and the instrumental, and they're going to be clashing and competing with each other. And worst of all, they're going to be eating up all the headroom. There's going to be no headroom available. And then you're going to have to go back in time and do some balancing further from there. Some people might prefer this approach, but I do not. I would much rather have the headroom available early and be able to clearly hear the vocal and blend them well before having to then go a little bit deeper and do some mastering. Mastering is the process where we're really gonna take this mix once it's done and increase the level and make up for any loss of loudness. So loudness, again, should not be the priority. Building in headroom early should be the priority, and that's what we've done here. Now, once you've set the instrumental level, the next thing you're gonna wanna do is balance your vocals and set them up. I've already done that for this lesson, so we don't have to spend a lot of time doing it, but if you do wanna see some videos on how to set levels. Click the card you're going to see on screen. You can watch a whole bunch of videos I did all about vocal mixing, setting levels and getting everything right. But at this point, you're going to want to go in and just set your vocal levels properly and just achieve a blend that you like. There's really no magic here. Just make sure things aren't clipping, make sure things sound good and they sound balanced with the beat, which I've already done once again. So let me unmute my acapella track and play where this track is sitting at this current moment. I'm going to play that same very loud section or the loudest section on the track. Here we go. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah so you can hear I got my vocals blended. You're some leads, some backgrounds and so on. And the truth is they are a little bit loud right now, but that's okay. You shouldn't necessarily worry about it. Just try to do your best to balance the vocals and get a blend that you like. And then we're going to do some additional stuff to get them to sit well within the beat, to bridge the gap between the mastered beat and the unmixed, unmastered vocals. So with that being said, let's talk for a moment about processing the instrumental. As I just mentioned, most of the tracks that you are working on that you're going to be dealing with when it comes to a two-track instrumental, they've been mixed, they've been mastered. Therefore, you don't need to do anything to the beat, at least not yet. Or if you do decide to do something to the beat, you should have a really good reason why you're going to do that. Some people will just automatically bust out a compressor, bust out an EQ, bust out a limiter and start doing all this stuff. Avoid doing that. The track is already mastered most times. Whether or not it's mastered well is another question, but you don't need to do a whole bunch of heavy lifting because most of that is already done for you. Focus first and foremost on setting the levels, like I said. Now, for me, one thing that stands out is that there are some variances dynamically. You can see that this track is obviously limited because everything is pretty much in line with one another, at least the loud moments. But you can see there is a drop off in terms of volume because the arrangement changes. The 808, I believe in this case, falls out or something falls out here and it's not the same. Let's actually investigate and see what this difference is. I'm unique. I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me up This time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Chillin' with a kiki, tipsy, up my teeny up 
New band in a bikini, oh she love bikinis. And she want me to come eat that up, yeah she need it. So in this case, it's not the 808, I was wrong. It's actually the kick. The kick falls out, but the 808 is still bumping in the background. Now, we have a few options of what to do here, right? I mean, I could just leave it. That's obviously option A. Option B is I could do some volume automation and maybe increase the level of these sections. Or option C is I could use a compressor to try to bridge the gap between each of these moments, but just very slightly because, again, this track has already been limited and we want to do this carefully. So let's quickly try something with the compressor. I'm going to take this and shrink it down. I'm going to go back to my instrumental master and I'm going to put on a compressor of my choosing. In this case, I'm going to use the BX Townhouse compressor, which is honestly what I would use. It's an SSL style compressor. Sounds really good. Something I really like. So I want to do this delicately. Okay. What I'm going to do to start is I'm just going to set a two to one ratio. I'm going to set a fast attack and a fast release to start. I'm going to reset my makeup gain. And then I'm going to just play the track. And again, these settings are a little bit aggressive to start. We're going to back off in a second. But what I'm going to do is just really play this section and try to get a little bit of a reduction on the louder moments. But then I'm going to add some makeup gain, which should ultimately benefit these quieter moments. OK, so we're going to really reference the louder section and then the quieter section and see how we can bridge the gap between them. But delicately, carefully, because again, if we do this too heavy handed, it's going to suck the life out of this and it's going to make it sound flat. OK, so let's do this. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With me and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Okay, so let's play this one more time, but you can see, and this is what I wanted. I wanted to achieve basically no compression here, but I wanted this quieter section to benefit from at least this makeup gain. However, the louder section, I wanted that to come down a little bit. And this is obviously why I say volume automation might have been a better play, but for efficiency, the compressor can ultimately achieve a very similar effect if we dial it in correctly. So let's play this again, and I'm just going to play going the transition in and just compare with and without the compressor. Here we go. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Chillin' with a kiki, tipsy, up my teeny Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Chillin' with a kiki, tipsy, up my teeny Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah This time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Chillin' with a kiki, tipsy, up my teeny so that makes sense. You can actually hear how the instrumental has increased in volume, increased in presence. I'm not killing the transients. I'm not killing it, the dynamics of it. And of course, even though my settings were pretty aggressive early, you saw me slow down the attack. So it's not clamping down as fast. Saw me slow down the release a little bit just to avoid any pumping kind of effects going on. But overall, everything is sounding much better. It's sounding closer to what I want. And again, this is not something I would always do. It's just particular to this situation because of the volume differences. So now that we've processed the two track, you now can move on and work on the vocal itself. A lot of these beats that you're going to be using, these two track beats, more often than not, they are already mixed and mastered. You're usually not dealing with just a unmixed track. Nine times out of 10, if you're buying a beat online or you're getting a beat from a producer, they're applying some sort of mixing and mastering to that track. Of course, they've balanced everything, but they're probably got a clipper, a limiter, and maybe even some other stuff on the mastering chain of that instrumental that's going to essentially squeeze the volume out of that track. And the challenge of this process is you're taking something that is barely even mixed and you're trying to get them to sit well on top of something that is not only mixed, but also mastered. That usually means that your vocal is going to be a lot more dynamic and have variances in volume, whereas the beat is going to be pretty much in the pocket. It's going to be consistent and sound consistent because of compression and limiting in particular. This typically results in a vocal that never quite sits perfectly within the beat, usually with it being either too loud or too quiet and ultimately feeling distinct from the instrumental rather than a part of it or within it. And you'll know you'll have this problem as well if you find yourself constantly reaching for the volume fader of your vocal, if you're constantly turning it up 
or down and you can't really find that sweet spot, chances are this is the problem. The beat is mastered, the vocals are too dynamic, and you have to find a way to bridge the gap between the two. And that means in order to get the vocal to sit better on a two-track beat, we need to apply some compression and some limiting to it to ultimately squeeze it a bit in order to match the level of compression within the two track itself. By matching the two, we can ultimately get them to feel a bit more similar to each other in terms of presence and consistency, and then we can reevaluate their actual volume fader blend in the context of the whole mix. Now, while I will go in and do some compression on the individual vocal tracks, I will also apply compression and limiting and really focus the limiting, especially on the vocal group where all the vocals go or the acapella master here. Now, to start, I'm going to go back to my acapella master and I'm actually going to copy the same compressor that I just used. However, I'm going to reset the settings so the threshold is all the way up, the attack and release are fast, and I'll reset the makeup gain. Now what I want to do is I want to play one of the louder sections of the vocal, so I'm going to find it here. Let's look at the hook in particular, and I'm going to dial in my compressor settings to achieve about 1 to 3 dB of gain reduction depending. So let's do that. This time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. So as you can see, I've adjusted the settings as I played through this, but you see we're getting somewhere around two to three dB of gain reduction on average. And you can definitely hear an improvement in the consistency. The vocals are definitely still loud. And I did add some makeup gain just to compensate for what we're losing. But I know right now that we're sitting in a good place. And again, we're going to be able to go in at the very end of this process and then rebalance our vocal acapella master and our instrumental master here. So they are sitting better and they're more in line with one another rather than dominating one another. Now, one advantage of using the compressor first here is I can actually follow this up with a limiter and the compressor is actually pre-treating the peaks, the loudest moments. That's what this compressor is really reacting to. When everything Ocean is getting really loud on the track, you can see it's addressing those peaks, squeezing them, compressing them, or obviously adding some volume, but that's going to pre-treat them so that way the limiter that's going to follow this is not necessarily going to react as aggressively or work as hard. So with that in mind, let's actually put a limiter onto our track now. I'm going to use the FabFilter Pro-L on this case. Now, before we do anything here, I'm actually going to deactivate it. What I want to do is switch the view over to peak, and let's see how much peak volume we have here. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With the thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. So in this case, our vocal has minus 3.2 dB of headroom. Now, the reason why I wanted to know that is because I want to use that as the setting for my out ceiling. What I'm essentially doing is I'm guaranteeing that the vocal is going to stay at that level or lower, right? That'll be the loudest the vocal can ever be with the out ceiling set this way. Now, this partly assumes that you like where your vocal is. If you want to create even more headroom, you can obviously set the out ceiling lower. But in this case, I'm going to match it for now. So with our out ceiling set to minus 3.2, I'm now going to play the track and add some gain. Now, as I add gain, my goal here is to ultimately achieve some gain reduction with the limiter, okay? I want gain reduction because ultimately that's going to be adding volume back to the track as it reduces the volume of the peaks. And by doing so, it's going to, again, match that volume or match the limiting and the effects of the compression and limiting that are taking place within the two tracks. So let's do that from scratch. Here we go. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. <laughs> With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. 
With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah So I want you to notice a few things. One, that amount of limiting was not consistent, right? We were not perpetually getting a, a gain reduction action. If I push this even further, sure, that would have been the case. But in this case, I'm really just driving it up enough to add some volume. You can hear that increase in presence as a result of doing so. But you can also see that only certain phrases, certain peaks, certain moments are actually getting reduced and capped down. Now, of course, you could push this a little bit more. You could definitely not push it as much. It depends on you and your track. But I feel like right now, getting that squeeze in this case is ultimately going to help increase the presence of the track here and get it to sit a little bit better so far. So at this stage, one thing that I want to do before I continue is I want to actually rebalance now the instrumental and the acapella groups. I want to see how are things sitting? Are they sitting in a good place in relation to one another? And the way that I do that is I actually take both of these tracks and I bring them down to infinite. So both of them now, when I play the track, you're going to hear absolutely nothing. As you can tell. So with that being said, we're now actually going to pay attention to our mastering track. Okay. Ignore this track. This master is really just my output and it's just showing me some monitoring stuff. It's not really relevant in this particular case, at least not yet, but this mastering track is going to show our headroom on our final output essentially. Now, what I want to do is similar to before, I want to set my instrumental level first, and then I want to bring in my acapella and set that level. Now, the reason why, again, I'm doing the instrumental first is because it's the most dynamic, it's the loudest. So I want to make sure that I I set that up and build in headroom first. And then from there, I can go in and bring my acapella in. Now we're going to now be focusing on the combination of the two. So while I gave you some numbers before, like minus seven, minus six, the reality here is we're probably going to set the instrumental a little bit lower than where we initially had it, bring our vocal in and then find a sweet spot between the two. So let's start by bringing in the instrumental first and knowing that they're combining, I'm probably going to try to have my instrumental hitting about minus 10. So that way, when I bring the vocal in, the combination of the two, is probably going to start being closer to a minus six or something like that total. Okay. I don't want you to be too obsessed with the numbers, by the way, but I do find having some numbers is a good guide, but use your judgment more than anything. It's not unusual for me to have a master that's peaking at minus three DB or minus four, minus five. It's not exactly minus six all the time. It really depends, but let's aim for minus six in this case. Here we go. Somewhere around there. I know it feels quiet. I definitely pushed it a little bit at first, but then, you know, let's leave it here about minus 10 for now. And we are going to readdress this again afterwards, but this is a good starting point. You see that we're peaking at minus 10.3. And now we're going to go in and bring in the vocal. Let's see. What a team that's freaky and she always need me. Yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a team that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. 
So that actually feels pretty good, but you can see here we're actually got even more headroom. We're at minus 8.7. So something I can do here is group these tracks together and then bring them up at the same time. That's the cool thing. Once you achieve a blend between the instrumental and acapella that you like, which I do in this case, you can now group them and then bring their volume up or down at the same time, preserving the balance between them, but ultimately able to obviously increase the loudness and reduce the headroom or the opposite, reduce the loudness and increase the amount of headroom available. So let's do that in this case. Let's increase the loudness of both of these tracks and get us closer to that minus six dB target in terms of headroom on the master. Here we go. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a team that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. So right here, we're hitting about minus 5.5. And one thing that's just catching me is I think the vocal's just a smidge too loud once again, especially as we start increasing this. Again, the relationship is mostly there, but it's not 100% perfect. So let me just ungroup and I'm gonna just reduce the acapella a smidge. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Now that seems pretty good, but before we continue talking about mastering, let's talk about a few strategies we can use to create more separation between the vocal and the instrumental. I know this whole time we've been talking about bridging the gap between them, which I think we've done. However, because of the vocal living in that upper mid range between usually a thousand and 5,000 Hertz, a lot of times the instrumental will have a lot of energy there as well. Claps, snares, maybe some percussion, keys, pads, different instrumentation can really dominate that area. And therefore the vocal and the the instrumental can ultimately clash in this area and make your vocal less articulate, less intelligible at times. So I'm going to show you three specific strategies you can use to avoid that problem. And make sure you stick around till the end because I am going to show you one plugin that'll do this automatically for you and make your life a lot easier as it has for me. The first strategy is stereo imaging. Recorded vocals are usually mono recordings, meaning they have one source. Just like me right now, I'm on one microphone, therefore it's one track. It's not two tracks, a left and a right. It's one single track. Track. Sure, you can stack vocals and pan them in a variety of ways to create stereo vocals, but main vocals in particular are usually presented right down the middle of a track stereo image. Knowing this, we can use stereo imaging to our advantage to create space for the vocal, effectively allowing us to pan or spread certain frequency pockets of the instrumental while allowing the vocal to remain mono and dominant in the center of the track stereo image. To do that, I'm first going to put a stereo imager plugin on my instrumental track. In this case, I'm going to use Ozone 11 Stereo Imager. From here, I'm going to create a band focused on where the vocal is most intelligible. Now, this is going to vary depending on your artist, but a lot of times this is from 1000 hertz all the way up to 5000 hertz. So knowing this, I could solo this frequency range and I can mute my acapella. I'm going to play the track and we're now going to hear what exactly lives in this frequency area of the instrumental. Now you can hear a variety of sounds there, including the 808, the snare, and even some of the instrument sounds, that guitar type of sound a little bit. And what we ultimately wanna do is take this and just push it so it's a little bit wider. And emphasis on little bit. I do not wanna push it to 100, because typically this will create some issues, phase issues, it'll wash out your track, because now it's just gonna be way too wide and less mono compatible. However, what I typically do is push it upwards of 20%, okay? So this is usually the maximum that I'll go, maybe less, but 20 is usually the cap off. That way we preserve some of that mono compatibility, but just slightly pan the instrumental. So that way the vocal can be focused into the middle of the stereo field in this case. Let's try it.
So it actually sounds pretty subtle and that's a good thing. We don't want this to be too drastic, but I wanna use this just as a way to allow the vocal to dominate the center once again. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually copy this same imager over to my acapella master, but instead of pushing it more stereo, I'm gonna reduce the width and make it more mono in this case. And very similarly, I don't really wanna go beyond 15 to 20%. So let's do that together. I'll mute my instrumental in this case so we can really focus on it and we can hear what it sounds like as we make it more mono. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah so a very subtle difference once again. Now, let's put these both in. I'm gonna move this down one and we can actually just play and hear the difference. Focus on the vocal in particular and let's see if we can hear a difference between the two of them as I bypass and put it in, particularly if the vocal comes out a little bit more and is easier to distinguish from the beat itself. Here we go. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique with a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. This time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy. Chillin' with a kiki, tipsy, up my teeny, yeah. So it's nice and subtle once again, definitely allowing the vocal to just come out a little bit more on top, but not in a super aggressive way. It's not killing the beat in an aggressive way. Again, just helping focus things a little bit into their own area of the stereo image. Now, the next two strategies I'm gonna show you, you can kind of use interchangeably. You're gonna to wanna to use one or the other. You're probably not gonna to wanna to use both of them because they achieve a very similar effect. But the first one is mid-side sidechain dynamic EQ. Yeah, that's a mouthful. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to the instrumental and we're gonna put on a dynamic EQ. In this case, I'm gonna use the Fat Filter Pro Q3. Now to take this a step further, I'm actually gonna put one on my vocal as well. And I can use this instrumental Pro Q for a second with the analyzer. I can set it to look at the vocal master. Now when I play this, it's gonna show you some frequency masking and overlap between the two sounds, particularly in red. And once we see that, we know that there are frequencies clashing between these two sounds and we can effectively use the dynamic EQ to prioritize the vocal over the instrumental or vice versa if we really need to. Let's try that. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Chillin' with a kiki, tipsy, up my teeny, yeah New band and bikini so I've identified these four frequencies, as you can tell. Again, this is the pro cue that's on the instrumental itself. Now we can decide if we want to prioritize the vocal over all four of them, or maybe over some of them. The truth is we definitely want to do it on the higher end frequencies, I would say, because that's where the vocal is most intelligible. Whereas these lower end ones may not necessarily be as important unless your vocal sounding really thin or unless there's some real bad phase issues happening in your track. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this first one, which is around 2,600, and I'm going to first set my key input to receive the signal from the vocal, which I've already set a side chain up for. Okay, so I got the vocal side chain here. So my acapella master is going to trigger this after I set up the rest of these settings. I'm going to now turn this band into a dynamic band. I'm also going to change my view mode to three. And what I'll do is I'll set this to a gradual reduction of about minus one for now, because we're affecting the entire instrumental. So anything beyond this is going to be a little bit too much, most likely. Although we do have the option to then push it further if we want, but I want this to be more transparent than anything. Now to continue, I'm going to make sure that my band is set to receive and recognize the key input, which I got to press this button here for. So now whenever the vocal passes this threshold, it's going to reduce this frequency on the instrumental. So let's do that right now. This time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique 
But a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah See how much more dominant the vocal becomes as I do this? Let's do the same thing for this upper band here. So I'm gonna just right click, make dynamic, bring it down to about minus one, make sure it's set to receive the side chain, and then I'm gonna play it and bring down my threshold. Here we go. This time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. So again, very subtle, but effective enough for you to just hear the difference, hear the vocal cutting out on top very clearly. And again, you can make the same decisions on the lower end if you want, but if you don't have the pro cue like I have here, really what you wanna do is focus on that main part of your vocal once again, which is somewhere between a thousand to 5,000. Of course, it's gonna depend on your vocalist. Some people have more presence higher, some people have more presence lower. It really depends, so you gotta use your judgment here. But ultimately, the dynamic EQ here can really work. Now, to take it one step further, because I did mention this should be a mid-process, is I've just done this on a stereo level. We can actually change the band so that it actually is focused on the mid-channel rather than the entire stereo field. And this, again, ties into that last point I mentioned about the stereo field and how we wanna focus the vocal into the middle. By doing this, we're essentially going to not affect the sides of the instrument, instrumental, but rather only the mid-channel of the instrumental. And this should ultimately be a little bit more subtle. So once again, if I bypass this, we can hear the difference. This time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Yeah. So hopefully you can hear the difference. And again, I do advise that you use this in the mid mode more than the stereo mode, but stereo mode could be an option as well, depending on how much interference is happening with your vocal. Like I said, though, there's two strategies here that I think you should use interchangeably. And the other strategy would be multiband sidechain compression. So what we could do is bypass this EQ, put in a multiband compressor, and effectively use this the same way. Now, the only reason why you may want to consider using a multiband compressor over a dynamic EQ is because a multiband compressor gives you access to some additional parameters, not just a threshold and a range, but also attack, release, ratio, knee, and potentially some other settings. And of course, this will depend on which exact dynamic EQ and which exact multiband compressor you're using. But I do find that multiband compressors have these stock, whereas not every dynamic EQ does. Just like the Pro Q I just showed you, the Pro Q doesn't have an attack, doesn't have a release doesn't have a ratio, but it does have a range and a threshold. That being said, we're going to use this in a very similar way. So to set this up, what we're going to want to do is a few things. First, if we want to be really smart, we can go into our vocal. I'm going to mute my instrumental. Just put an EQ on your vocal. I'm going to play it and just try to find out where is the vocal most dominant? What's the range that it's most dominant in? And again, you're going to typically find that it's somewhere around that 1,000 to 5,000 range. That's where it's most intelligible. Where we can actually understand and hear the vocal clearly and understand what the artist is saying. So let's do that. This time you need so you can see here, a little bit shy of 2,500 is really the most dominant area for Oshan in this case. So I'm going to just close that up. I'm going to unmute my instrumental, and I'll bring this band to be somewhere around there, so 2,500. Now, maybe I'll just bring my low bands a little bit lower so it's closer to that 1,000 range, and the top band I'll leave roughly where it is, just beyond 5,000. Now to start for settings, I'm going to set a fast attack, a fast release. I'll leave my ratio at four to one in this case, or set it to four to one if you're using a different multiband compressor. I'm going to set my range to minus one because that's the maximum I'm going to want to achieve. I'll also set my view mode to three just so that we have a better idea of what we're achieving here. And now we have to set up the side chain part. So I'm going to just set my key input to the Vox side chain, and I'll set the Pro MB to receive signal from that, the external side chain here, so it knows to use the vocal as the trigger in this case. So now I'm going to reset my thread threshold, play the track and bring this down and try to achieve that full reduction when the vocal is happening. And if you noticed, even in the last one, I wasn't just statically trying to reduce it. I wanted to breathe. I wanted to move because I still want that dynamic movement between the two tracks, but this should ultimately help them breathe a little bit better and gel a little bit better while still prioritizing the vocal at key moments. This time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. 
Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah This time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy Chillin' with a kiki, tipsy, up my teeny, yeah New band in a bikini, oh she love Bellini And she want me to come meet that up, yeah she need it mm, Used to be selfish, yeah, used to be greedy Now I say take that, take that, let go Didi And the way she shake that, make that real so steamy I ain't never gonna tap out, I'ma tap in Sweetie so you can hear in this case how the vocals just being prioritized once again, very similar to before, but of course we're not focusing on individual frequencies, but rather an entire pocket. And as you notice, as I played it, I adjusted some of these parameters. I slowed down the release to make things sound a little bit smoother, right? I left the attack pretty quick because I do want the vocal to trigger that compression. However, if you do find that it's a little bit too pumpy sounding, well then you could slow down the attack time so it's not happening as aggressively. But overall, this is doing what I want. And if we want to make it even more transparent, we can go in and adjust our mix blend here so that way it's not as noticeable if it is noticeable but because this is a minus one db reaction it's pretty subtle it shouldn't be that noticeable of course if you're pushing it even further to minus two minus three minus four probably using the mix knob would be better but i am trying to do this in a subtle way because we are affecting the entire instrumental now as i mentioned there is a tool that could do a lot of this automatically for you and it's pretty foolproof if i'm being honest and that tool is this track spacer now this is not sponsored by any means but this is a really cost effective tool that i find does both of what I just showed you, the dynamic EQ stuff and the multiband compression stuff really effortlessly, and it achieves really good results. So all you really got to do is once again, set up your side chain. So you're going to get the signal from your vocal, and then you're going to play your track and you're going to basically set your low cut and your high cut. And really you want to focus on that same area. So even what we just did, we could just dial that in pretty much like a scientist, about 5,000 and 1,000 Hertz. And then all we're going to do is play and increase the ratio this amount here. And what's going to happen is you're going to start to see this thing automatically decide what frequencies to reduce on the instrumental that overlap with the vocal. Here we go. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me, yeah. Pretty damn effortless if you ask me, and that's why I like using this. You could definitely hear the difference. I will say if you push it too far, you will start getting some artifacts and some weird stuff happening. When used delicately, like I just did here, you can understand how this will help you really achieve that separation between the two, between your two track beat and your vocal very quickly and very easily. Now we've covered a lot here so far, but there is one final piece to the puzzle, which is final mastering. Final mastering can make a massive difference in how your two track beat and vocal sit with one another because now you're gonna do some processes like EQ, compression, maybe saturation, and definitely some sort of final limiting to drive the level up. That final limiter in particular, I find can really change relationships between sounds in your mix, especially the vocals and the beat as a whole. I'll find that when I do this stuff, usually either the beat or the vocal will just come out a little bit too much and now require some additional adjustment, perhaps reblending the balance between the two groups or maybe even something deeper than that. This is actually why I'm a big fan of top-down mixing. Top-down mixing is when you set up your mastering and then your groups and then your individual tracks. And doing that first really helps you understand how your final product of your song is gonna sound very early on in the process because you start mixing into those processes. They definitely have some things that work against it at the same time, but overall I find it's a really efficient way to work. I'll eventually do a video on that topic, but if you wanna see a top-down mixing video, let me know in the comments down below. That being said, as much as I want to go deep into mastering, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. So instead, what we can do is simply apply a final limiter to our mastering track, adjust that and see what happens. See if the relationships between the vocal 
and the instrumental change, and if some additional work is required. So let's do that together. I've got the Ozone 11 maximizer here, which is a limiter with a few extra bells and whistles. And what I'm gonna do is just set this up in a specific way. And really I'm gonna just drive the volume and make sure that we're able to achieve some gain reduction, but also increase the overall loudness of our track. So what I'm gonna do is set my output level to minus one, and I'm doing that just to make sure that I have some headroom for streaming services. They do typically recommend you have at least one dB of headroom, at least last that I checked. We could change our curve here, and I'm actually going to set this to modern in this case, but you can obviously choose any curve you want, or if you're using a less fancy limiter, you don't even have to worry about it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drive the gain up until I start seeing some gain reduction. And what I might do, in the process is just check in on my streamliner here and see what we're hitting LUFS wise in terms of levels. So let's do that. Here we go. This time you need me, I'll be in testing Nikki. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in testing Nikki. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in testing Nikki. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me yeah. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique What a thing that's freaky and she always need me Next time you need so that seems to be pretty good. We're hitting at least minus 10 LUFS. I could push this harder, get us to minus nine, minus eight, which is usually the area I'm in. But considering that I have no mastering going on except for this limiter, that's pretty good. I've obviously used the soft clip functionality and I've driven the gain up at least 11 dB. I had it at 12, but I backed off, brought it down to 11. And overall, the transients are still hitting. Everything is still fairly clear in my opinion, at least so far. And you can see that on the gain reduction side of things, we're not always losing something. But when the kick comes in, that's when we start to actually really lose some of that information and we're losing upwards of about 4 dB a little bit more a little bit less sometimes but 4 dB at the most I would say and that seems to be pretty good but what I notice as I've done this now is the vocal really starts to stand out maybe you noticed it too so what would I do in this case? Well, I would just simply go back into my track and I love doing it this particular way. I'm gonna go to the actual drum section where the kick is hitting, cause that's obviously the loudest. And I'm gonna actually bring my vocal all the way out of the mix once again, okay? I could have left it at that minus 12 and a half and just set it from there. But I like to always reevaluate, reset things from scratch. Cause I find sometimes you get used to hearing things a certain way. Rebalancing it from nothing is a lot more helpful in my opinion. So I'm gonna play this and bring up the acapella master and see if we can find a good level for here we go. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me. That sounds pretty good. Let's check the more dynamic sections where the kick isn't playing. This time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. With a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Next time you need me, I'll be in Tessanique. What a thing that's freaky and she always need me. Yeah. This time you need me, I'ma be booked and busy. Tell her what a kiki to see a martini. Yeah. New band in a bikini, oh she love the leaves. She want me to come eat that up, yeah she need it.
Now that feels pretty good, to be honest. And I did reduce the volume of the acapella, as you could tell, by at least two and a half dB. We're sitting at minus 15.2 now. It was originally at minus 12.5. And I do still think there is some finesse required here, maybe some automation, to be honest, because the vocal can really poke out on top sometimes during those quieter moments of the beat. But then during the louder moments of the beat, you could hear how the vocal is sitting either perfectly or maybe just a smidge too quiet. So a little bit of finesse is definitely in order here, but I hope that these different ideas and strategies help you, especially if you're mixing your own tracks, your own vocals over two track beats. Now, while I wanted to go deeper into mastering, I couldn't do so here, but I definitely recommend you check out another video I did all about mastering with Isotope Ozone, which I'll leave on screen right now. I appreciate you guys for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button if you got value out of this video and subscribe if you're new. I'll catch y'all next time. Peace. Five.